Uh, I see on my schedule that the next uh, actually slot is my, but uh, I actually used it already. So we had, uh, it says that it, uh, we, we should have a uh, biker society panel. But uh, no, no, Artemi, please stay. <coughs> stay here. Okay. Um, I'm here. We had, we had biker society panel earlier during the break when our colleague Felix told us. Uh, the, the plan for, for the next biker in Mexico. For, for those who missed that part, that was really important. What, what, I, uh, what I still have uh, possible at this moment is, is a discussion of uh, the, the second panel discussion, and I really want uh, Artemi to be a part of it. Uh, the discussion of uh, goals and challenges of biker today. We sort of started our movement when we initiated the Biker Society, the Biker Journal, the Biker Conference, and so on, with declaring the Biker Challenge, which is to replicate uh, in a computer the, uh, the uh, highest cognitive abilities of the human mind uh, in conditions of real life. And uh, that would mean that we would have um, something or somebody capable of integration with us uh, in the society at a social level. And this is something we can expect, uh, like new, new technological revolution, but it doesn't happen. And we see that development goes possibly in a wrong way, and there are multiple possibilities and still we can do something at this point. And the question is, what what are the uh, the burning uh, questions or the tasks that need to be addressed and how? Because, uh, well, I... Okay, um, so so I had, I had this list of questions uh, for, for the panel, but, but I really um, uh, appreciate that Artemi expressed uh, this um, position right now in his talk just before before I have uh, an opportunity to say something because uh, I, I I need uh, I think we need something bigger some kind of uh, major breakthrough and uh, it's true that all science consists of uh, such small steps. And this is what uh, what comes into textbooks eventually, and uh, creates our knowledge of the world. But uh, at at the point where where we are now, I I believe we need something bigger. We need something more radical. Like for example, uh, let me ask you why those intelligent agents like Siri. Uh, or IBM Watson, whatever, uh, Cartana, but there are so many of them. Uh, they, they all are rejected by humans, actually, at the social level. And nobody is interested in them uh, as, um, as social partners. At least that's what people tell me. And I myself personally also, of course, obviously joined them. So one, one possible answer, let me just uh, give for, for the beginning of discussion, is uh, I believe they are too confident, as strange as it sounds. Because when I drive and the navigator tells me to go through the route which which is closed because of uh, road work. Um, I, it would continue telling me that for 20 minutes as I go around that place without noticing that something is wrong with this recommendation. And so whatever you take, an assistant that uh, answers you on the phone when you call, or an agent that helps you on the web page to, to accomplish something, or, or any, any other artificial uh, agent interacting with you, uh, the, the, the problem, I think, is that this agent believes that he is the all-knowing guru and the human should obey his instruction. But the human believes that 
he knows everything and this is the dumb AI that <laughs> should, should, should be turned off. <laughs> so what what could be a possible solution? Like just make it less confident, like it, make it a, a little self-critical. I do not mean uh, metacognition or uh, self-analysis, but just reduce this uh, impotence, this co confidence in, in self, and maybe th then it will become a socially attractive agent. So that, just an idea to start. Please. I, I see Sam wants to say something. I, I share your frustration, Alexei, with the lack of progress. Uh, not not with this body of people. You know, everybody here is doing research. Everybody's working hard. Everyone's trying to put this put this elephant into some sort of shape to, to attack. But you know, we had we had a workshop on mapping artificial general intelligence. It was the, it was the cover story of a AI magazine. Oh, I was part of one ago. of those workshops, by the way. You were one. You were one of the authors. You were you and me were co-authors with several yeah. people. And we were and and back then, if you'd have said to me that 14 years from now we would still be more or less in the same place. I would have had a hard time believing that, but that's, that's, I mean, it's not entirely true. There's, there's been really interesting advances in, in some areas, but the big goal is still seems as far away. And I don't know, maybe it's just needs another generation's energy to take it over and run, run hard with it. So, but, so what's uh, the problem? I feel the same way. What's the problem? What's the solution? Oh, please, uh, hard. I don't know. I mean, do I ask me for answers? I'm good for questions. Don't ask me for answers. <laughs> Let's say, first of all, I, I would like to thank you for what a great, again, workshop. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the last three years of, of everything you've done. It's, for somebody like me, it's really well appreciated. I'm so glad to be part of the group and much better for me than the medical side. It's so great. I had a chance to develop I so. ideas. <laughs> I, I have an answer. It's to better to work with AI very, people than this. It has a this pretty answer. patience. <laughs> It's, it's a, it's a one-word answer, and it's causality. Huh. Here's the problem. All these neural networks out there, there's no causality in it. I don't care how good a Google net, neural network is, there's no causality. There's no pre-causality. You have pre, any, any animal that has a hippocampus has pre-causality. There's no pre-causal behavior. If you, once you put some pre-causal behavior, you put causality in it, your, 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 your um, navigator, the example you gave, won't behave like that. I think the problem is, is that we're trying to go, you know, people are talking about Turing things and then we're going to gazing. There's such a huge difference. I think uh, mathematics actually has to be developed, which isn't in this field, unlike other ones. Um, you know, you can go from, there's the leg equation, leg, Marcus Hutter and leg, Marcus Hutter, who became famous in um, theoretical computer science and leg, who started actually Google DeepMind, they had an equation showing universal knowledge. The problem with that equation is there's a term in there called McGraw complexity. It's not solvable. And so you can't solve it. You need, you can only, like, you can only capture parts of it. And the way to capture it is the way nature did it, or the way we did it is, is causality, cause and effect. And um, I think once you put cause and effect in, you can start doing interesting things. And I think our group is the best group to do it because a lot of everybody else, they're just fixed on deep learning. You, you should, have you ever been in a self-driving car? You have no idea how stupid they are. Yeah. You, you, it, you know, I've been in Tesla, tel tel no, and they keep saying they're going to make it bigger and bigger and get more data and get more data. And, and I know it's amazing what they're doing. They're getting more data, but it's really stupid. And I think people like us are in a position where we can think about it and say, hey, you know, it's fantastic in neural networks what you're doing, but it's not going to work. And um, I share your sentiments 100%. And um, I think other people are aware of it too. I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's not just you. I think other people are aware of it too. But, but so everybody is aware, but nobody knows what to do. Yeah, everybody is aware. Yeah. Oh, uh, may I may I contribute with sure. this, uh, yes. Alexei? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> I, I I I have uh, studied a little bit about that, uh, and and it's interesting. For example, what happens with uh, cartoons, uh, Disney cartoons, for example. And, and they have uh, uh, studied uh, very uh, uh, deeply uh, a notion that they call believability. So uh, it, it seems that uh, it, it's a, a psychological trick that they use in their cartoon. So uh, when you, you look at the Disney cartoon, you, you really think that there is a, a character 
over there and this character has a, 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 a mood, this character has a, a, a lot of, of, of things that gives us the impression that there is really a, a, a character over there that we are watching. And, and I believe that uh, the, the trick for understanding that comes from uh, Roman Jacobson, uh, the, the linguist. Uh, he had uh, made a, a study on, on the different uh, communicative functions that you have when you are exchanging some kind of interaction with, with someone else. And uh, there is uh, something that we could call it uh, attachment uh, or uh, contact, or, or uh, Jacobson himself has called it a conative uh, function. And this is how much uh, we are bound to the person that we are talking to. If you don't have this contact, if you don't have this attachment, then uh, the communication don't flows uh, very well, okay? Uh, and, and this happens also to people, you know? If you have a student that uh, don't understand what you're saying and, 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 and he keeps repeating wrong things and you perceive that well, you, you see how dumb this, is, this student is because uh, he is not being able to get in touch with me and, and, and make this, this, this binding, this, this uh, uh, contact. Uh, we also have that, for example, in animal studies. And uh, there is an impressive uh, uh, study uh, uh, with people uh, working with gorillas. And uh, it's quite interesting because if you start to, to uh, move around in a community of gorillas, they will ignore you, you know? Uh, they are not, it's just like you are not there. But uh, some researchers, they start uh, approaching the gorillas in, in a certain way in which at some point the gorillas start perceiving you maybe like a gorilla to and, and accept to, 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 to start this, this communication with you, okay? So I, I believe that all of those things, uh, they are hints that we should try to take this issue of believability. I believe that eye contact, just like uh, uh, um, our colleague has shown here, I, I, I think it's really important, this issue of eye contact, because this is one of the important things that will create this attachment, this kind of bounding that you have with someone that you are talking to, and you know that this person or this character, let's say, is understanding what you're saying, and, 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 and so there is a connection, you see? If you don't have this connection, we will feel uh, far from, 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 from the agent. And, and, and I believe that this is the reason for the lack of success because maybe we are not investing in these uh, details, these eye contact, uh, these are psychological tricks that makes us think that there is really a character over there. And, and so I, I'm not losing my time trying to talk to, to it. No, 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 you are preaching to the choir. I agree with you. Eye contact is important. Uh, mimics is important, uh, body language is important, whatever. But if we are going to move by such small steps, then we achieve human level in a thousand years. And that's not what we want to happen, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so right. Something is wrong with our approach, or maybe the goals that we have. Artemi, what do you think? Uh I agree with Ricardo about cartoon characters. Uh, I would say from my side that uh, a teddy bear is a great uh, example of an emotional interface. So um, it doesn't do anything, but it's a great toy and, and children just enjoy it. That, that's that's, uh, that's all and, but... and teddy bear can say, eh, and that's enough. That's, that, that's, that's, that's not enough. What are you going to do with it? What are the applications? What are the practical applications of those things? Okay, children speak with it. Children may think that the teddy bear understands them. That's, that's, that's great. Right. So you, you are building a toy for children. That's it, right? No. Uh, we, this, our civilization builds 
teddy bears for children <laughs> and they work just great for for children so forget uh, technological then, revolution then, forget then, integration uh, of ai into society at a social level it's all just right. for, for children and for their toys not only uh our level um our level of um, results uh is suitable to provide um emotional companions uh for children right that's that's already well, maybe great. Maybe you should first then, convince gorillas that we have something. <laughs> no, I cannot. I'm not, I'm not a specialist in gorillas. And then, as Ricardo told, uh, it's it's great to think about cartoon characters, and we just try to make uh, a robot which looks like a cartoon character. And what we see in our experiments, indeed, when people come to this robot, they look at this robot, they say, "Hello, what's your name?" "Hello," they touch it. And these are these are primary cognitive tests. Uh, so, and as the robot fails this simple test, uh, people just uh, refrain from it is, and say, "All right, this is an experiment. What I have to do with this robot?" So, uh, the robot has That's failed. All fine, and, but where are you going with this? What's the next step? What's the goal? Uh, so, we want to um, right now we. Uh, Maybe I told at this conference that we uh, make uh, a huge corpus of uh, emotional interaction. We record people yeah. interacting with different in different emotional situations uh, at the university, at some uh, public, uh, public public municipal services. We have emotional interviews. We have many hours on, and uh, hundreds of thousands of annotations for smiles, for movement, for stretching, for facial you expressions. You are not the only one, by the way. You are trying to build Indeed. everything yeah. from Indeed. scratch, and, whereas and other try... people do the same in parallel, and you Indeed. ignore so, the, their results uh, largely. So we try, we try to cluster that and it attach uh, some minor reactions to the robot so that the robot resembles a person in some minor uh, emotional reactions and uh, eye movements and some simple questions, answers, and so on. So, uh, from our point of view, the robot has to be charming, like a teddy bear, uh, but doesn't have to uh, answer um, some compound questions, some complicated questions. And modern information architectures, they generally target the questions of uh, uh, of answering some compound questions, uh, which is which doesn't apply to cartoon characters, which doesn't apply uh, to cats and dogs, which are also a great example of emotional in interface. Okay, they so where is the breakthrough? Where is huh? the technological revolution? Uh, we are doing that right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. You are doing it. And, and when you're done, what happens? What happens when you are done? Um, we think that uh, some, um, uh, some maybe we think maybe that when, some what, set of emotional technologies, uh, the technologies of emotional interaction, like like gaze contact, like basic speech contact, like touch uh, contact, and adequate responses of the robot can uh, establish this kind of attachment so, uh, so that the person understands that this is a robot. Okay, this is a robot. Uh, but uh, in fact, I'm attached to this robot. Uh, there are very interesting um, examples. Maybe you know an article uh, by... Uh, I think soon go and colleagues about uh, vacuum cleaners, about iRobot, iRobot Roomba. Uh, they have interviewed people who make uh, some suits uh, for these robots. They they give names. They make suits. They try so, to uh, try to so make contacts want? between the robots. So uh, so there is a, there is a very small group of users, but they get an emotional attachment to vacuum cleaners. Yeah, that's yeah, great. So some somebody even married the robot. I, I read the story. Yes. By the way, that's, uh, so that's you, great. You are we, talking but... about uh, gays. Antonio Kella is talking about inner speech. But where are you going with all this? There is also theory of mind because it's important yeah, when you are talking to someone else. We need to okay. to to try to understand what the the other one is is thinking about and and if the theory of mind 
the model that I create in my mind doesn't fit with the behavior of the robot, it, it creates some disattachment between me right, and the robot. All right, Ricardo, and you are telling me, I agree with you, but my question is, are you trying to walk to the moon? Like like John McCarthy used this example, you, you cannot disprove that it's impossible to walk to the moon by simulation. It looks like you are starting simulation without knowing what are you trying to simulate. You are making some random steps in random direction and climb that you make progress, but where are you going with all this? And how is it related to our needs? Or Olga wants to say something. So, yeah, let me continue with my five steps. Uh, it seems to me that the idea to use robots as toys for children is very promising and very fruitful because the generation of children who plays with robots like a toys, who loves robots, uh, this generation uh, will understand what to do with robot, uh, robotics, uh, robotechnics and what to do to... Uh, to make real robots, to make uh, um, the world of Isaac Asimov. So you say that our about. generation will not make a breakthrough. It is only... Why? At, at best, it's the next generation. <laughs> well, maybe, but maybe not. Or maybe not. You know, or maybe you, not. Know, you know the phrase, uh, uh, you shouldn't train children, you should love him, them. Okay, so the best we can do is raise children. Okay, got it. I'd like to make a comment on that. Please, please. It uh, could be true for robots. Uh, you shouldn't uh, train robots. You should love them. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Sam. For, for a great many years, there have been uh, a, a group of psychologists and and uh, oh, philosophers can you turn your camera on or you don't have it i don't have oh sorry there's been a school of thought that the one thing missing from the study of cognition is a first person approach there are many functions of cognition that we can't understand uh, externally from a third person approach that can only be under understood by a first person approach, which is self inspection. The longest tradition that we have on this earth of self, self inspection is a tradition that goes back 4,000, maybe even, maybe even 8,000 years, according to some people. But the long and the short of it is, I believe, and uh, I, hope to, I hope to show through my very short talk, which is only about seven and a half minutes, but I believe that by uh, by replicating this tradition, uh, in effect, turning it into math, we can exponentially increase our capacity to uh, understand, reuse, and converge on a single best understanding of all the models of cognition that you presented in this workshop. So I, bl I believe that the breakthrough is right around the corner if not here, but uh, I leave it to you to, uh, to tell me whether what I've, sh what I've shown you is absolute madness, whether it's too simplistic. Or should, or we vote? Should, by the way, should we vote who believes that the breakthrough is around the corner? Please raise well, your hand. But before voting, you have to see, see the- You have the, to uh... see talk. <laughs> Sorry. Alexi, I have a question. What what would surprise us? I think an interesting thing is, you know, we all oh, get it. I'm not sure. I'm not talking to you, uh, Alexa. Uh, <laughs> speaking of our topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff is listening. Jeff is listening somewhere. Um, no, I was thinking about all this discussion and we go, oh, but, you know, we've got this part that we haven't dealt with, like attachment, or we haven't done, we, we still have to do the theory of mind or whatever it happens to be. And there's so many of those areas, right? And we all struggle to try to get it all into our head. We talk about that a lot. But I was thinking things that don't surprise us anymore, or maybe did at once. Like when were you first surprised by uh, a speech recognition system like the one sitting over here? Uh, what would surprise you about a cognitive architecture when it was running that you would go, 
that's something that's different because I think it's kind of an inverse way of looking at, at, um, at uh, a breakthrough. Uh, Rodney Brooks used to call it the juice. You know, he'd say, he'd say that system's got the juice. I don't know what it is. You know, but, okay. uh, Eli Eliezer used to call it juju. You know, he said, does this thing have a juju, <laughs> the juju or not? So what you, would that be? What would surprise you? You ask me a question. Let me let me give you a, a, an analogy as a part of my answer. Actually, it is a law. If you look through the history of uh, science and technology, you will uh, find this law that whenever uh, a big breakthrough happens, then there is always a condition when there is a task uh, that the society faces that must be solved. And there is no means of solving this task except for this new element that just emerged. And the, probably one of the best examples is the computer itself. So just remember how computers emerged. The, the first task for, for which they were used was calculation of ballistic uh, trajectories of projectiles. And that's the only reason why computers started developing, not because somebody discovered uh, uh, logical circuits, transistors, and so on, but because there was a practical application, and immediately there was a result. And then immediately came the next task, the atomic bomb. They wanted to compute scattering of neurons, and there was no other way to do it except on the computer. And that's it. This is done. I mean, after that, there were millions of applications, and now we have completely new society. So I guess what we need is uh, this key task that can be solved only with emotional, artificial intelligence, and not by any other means. And um, uh, may, yeah, sorry. Maybe uh, Alexei, the, the the wrong thing that you are doing is that we are creating agents to be servants, to be slaves and not to be companions. Maybe if we, if we think that, okay, I'd like to have an agent that could be my companion. Uh, if we think about that and we think, okay, what kind of uh, talk to this agent could engage me such that I could see it as a companion and not as a slave or a servant that doing something for me. Maybe this is a kind of, 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 of changing uh, uh, an idea on, on, on how an agent should should behave that could lead to what you are thinking that 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 is the breakthrough uh, idea. Because if we start thinking about the agent as a companion, we need to ask ourselves: Well, what is a companion to me? What, what is uh, uh, a, a behavior that we should expect from an agent that I could attribute this companionship? Uh, 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 okay, uh, but I actually did not finish my answer. Thank you for helping me. So yes, if you do that, and you create a real companion, real uh, feeling, soul, life, being, uh, it would take years to convince the society that this is not a dumb idiot, that you can actually accept it as a companion. But uh, what what we need is this key problem that can only be solved with this technology. And I was thinking, by the way, even before Sam asked me yesterday, days before, I was thinking exactly about this problem. And uh, to be honest, I do not know the answer, but one candidate I can give you, maybe several of them. Like, for example, uh, uh, when you today in this pandemic situation, when you enter a building, usually they measure your temperature with the device. They put a thermometer uh, to, to your hand and remotely sense your temperature. What if there was a device that similarly could measure your psychological condition? Then you could fight terrorism. You could, uh, you see, uh, solve many, uh, many social problems that we are facing today. And what would it take to, to create this measurement device? Imagine that you uh, go through the procedure of uh, reception or registration in the airport, uh, in, in the uh, hotel, in, in, in the conference, in the uh, shopping uh, or whatever, in, in the bank. You go through filling some forms, making some uh, choices, and uh, this is done basically automatically. Imagine that uh, some virtual agent would interact with you during this process and would react emotionally to every your step and guide you through, uh, through it. And 
during this process, during this interaction, it will learn about your uh, your psychology, your current condition, your personality type. And, and this would be like a measurement device, which in one minute will give you the exact portrait of, of your personality type and your current psychological state. So any criticism of that? And then it will be... Sorry? I didn't hear what you said. And, and who was that? Oh, you, your, your mic is turned off, I believe. Yeah, just, just turn your oh, microphone. I, yeah, okay. I wanted to make one quick comment about that sure, sure. as someone from the social impact space. We, we don't solve the problems that need to be solved. We solve the problems that are aligned with uh, the interests of the problem solvers. <laughs> yeah. uh, when it comes to solving poverty, for example, uh, we, we don't solve, we don't choose the solutions that maximize impact on uh, poverty for those, on, for those that are poor. We choose the solutions that maximize impact for the donors. Uh, because they're the ones that are responsible, that are in the decision-making position. So when it comes to a problem that can motivate the development of AGI, uh, that's a difficult one. So there is no answer. One of possible candidate solution for a big problem is something... I am adding on, but I am not ready to report on it on cognitive level right now. We are working on, on comprehension, on modeling comprehension and operation, because for now we often have complex semantic models and then ops, simple similarity measure, but not comprehension and not action in it. For now, we are starting to build a system that can model all possible parts of reasoning about something and simple topics that can ask questions, that can determine errors and determine the cause of errors, all the possible wrong reasoning paths that lead to the conclusion that the student or another human user make. It takes a lot of complex models, even for simple tasks. But it brings closer to comprehension, to understanding to system that can explain and tell why the human is wrong until the human achieves comprehension. And it can solve the task that it teaches human. Maybe it can be one of the overarching problems. And the neural methods are absolutely no go there because they often lead to very strange conclusions. Okay. Any other thoughts? Or should we proceed with the, the talk uh, the, or the, that's uh, next on our schedule? Unless somebody wants to say something. I have a thought. Oh, please. Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, this, this conversation has migrated across a great number of different topics. But I think one key thing that uh, was sort of mentioned was the importance of building systems that can understand uh, people. Uh, it's, yeah. it's more than just looking in the eye. It's, it's the fact that the system can actually understand what you're saying, uh, understand your concerns, and think of things to do to respond to uh, your wishes or, and, and so forth. So that's, that, that's a key thing. Second thing is that um, this is not an easy problem. Um, it's, it's something, it seems easy to us because we do this innately, and, but it's very difficult to make a machine do it. So, uh, but the key thing I think is focusing on understanding how do systems actually understand. And there are different levels of understanding. Uh, there's understanding language and there's understanding patterns that we see. So it's a very complex problem. Um, but I believe that if we focus on the, th the three different levels of, of an architecture, the linguistic level for understanding and building systems that uh, can understand natural language with natural language being the internal language of representation for the system. That's one key thing. Uh, the other thing that is, is key is this idea of creating an intelligence kernel. That's what I call it. Uh, but it's also been called a seed AI. 
a self-developing, self-extending system that can learn to understand its environment, learn to understand other intelligent creatures, and uh, understand uh, natural language. Um, that's a very key concept because uh, as long as we're trying to, to write all the code ourselves, uh, we're not going to do it unless we focus on writing a, a core system that is self-extending. And that kind of a system could, uh, at least uh, in theory, um, be able to uh, take the next leap. So those are just uh, some initial thoughts, but that's the key ideas behind uh, the approach that I advocate Thank you. Uh, towards building, uh, achieving human level AI. So let's go around and everybody says uh, final final comment. Uh, who wants next? Mm, I guess we are exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm very curious to hear uh, Andy Williams' uh, solution. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. Maybe, course, maybe we should proceed with uh, Andy. Let's move on. There's some good stuff still to come, I'm sure. Sorry? I think. Uh, he said there's some good stuff still to come, uh, I'm sure. Thank oh, you for that. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'm just uh, going to. I also would like to, to thank every uh, panelist of this ad hoc emergent panel. Uh, I think we understood something really important today. And <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> So um, the next talk is by Andy 